Hello Sofa Squad. Today we're going to be talking about a case about a trial that was so shocking, so disturbing, had so many rabbit holes to go down. I had to go back and watch it a couple more times. And even on the second or third time, my mouth was on the floor. Today we're gonna to be talking about the tragic case of baby Kalia. She was only 14 days old when her time here was stolen. Now sadly, this is a case about two people. And sadly, it's about the parents. Now, one of them would eventually be convicted of basically creating the environment in which her new baby girl was never going to succeed in. Now, the other one, the father, most likely in a moment of rage that was surging due to the substances running through his veins, took the life of his sweet baby girl. Now, the sentencing aspect of this case has gone viral. This is not, you know, a fresh case, it's a little bit old, but but because of the father, Christopher Chris McNabb, and what happened during his sentencing, which yes, we will be getting to that, uh, it has just kind of blown up all over the internet or whatever. So a lot of people know it from that aspect. And even just that little clip, you're like, what? But at the heart of this case is like this viewpoint into this underbelly of society. And that's one of the factors that makes it really hard to look away from. So for this video, I'm gonna be going over the trial. I'm gonna be talking about the aspects of the trial, some of the people in the trial that I found to be interesting and that stuck out to me, and we're going to go ahead and get into it. Now, the two defendants in this case are Courtney Bell, that is the mother, and her cousin slash baby daddy slash on again, off again lover, slash a whole bunch of other things, Christopher McNabb, he is the father of the baby. So now with opening statements, the big looming question of this case, this trial, is what happened on October 7th between the hours of 9.30 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. that took the life of this little baby girl? Now the prosecutor is Layla Zahn in this case. She is amazing. I love her. I don't want to call it a performance, but I love that the job that she did, I loved how you could authentically see that, yeah, she was pissed off. You know, it was not somebody who was up there feigning outrage. I mean, this is an outrageous case that draws that emotion up. And she was so professional, yet at the same time, expressed a lot of what I think most of us were thinking when we see this. Now, since this trial, she has become a judge on the Superior Court of the Alcove Judicial Circuit. So, September 23rd, 2017, baby Kalia is born. Now, she is a bit premature. Now, the state outlines that the evidence that will be presented will show that within 14 days of her being born, that she, her life is taken and she is left in the woods, wrapped in clothes, in a, in a bag and left in a hole. Now the state alleges that yes, Christopher McNabb did this and that the mother Courtney was too busy smoking the pipe to do anything about it. Now sadly, another aspect to this is, I mean, 14 days old is just crazy for that to be the length of time that this child lived. These two parents, I don't even wanna call them that, these two people, didn't even have her that whole time. They were pawning her off on family members. So, I mean, there's that. They barely even had this child. Now, the state, of course, outlines some of the evidence that will be shown. Some of that involves 911 phone calls, police body cam footage, uh, as well as, you know, testimony saying, you know what? Yeah, when we got to the scene of uh, officers and whatnot, Christopher McNagg came from the woods. He was all muddy. And these are the woods where the baby was found. Uh, we're gonna hear from family members, people close to the family talking about how, yes, these children, the McNabb and Bell children will be pawned off on them, how their for first and foremost focus was not children, but feeding their addictions. In regards to the defense's opening statements, first of all, both McNabb and Bell each have their own attorneys, and so they're each going to try and concoct something to get out of this. Uh, it's pretty much like grasping at straws as far as I'm concerned, but that's here nor there at this point. Now, right off the bat, Christopher's attorney says he had nothing to do with this and this will be a hard pill to swallow throughout the case but we're here to hear what he says. Now the defense will walk through the chain of events and they establish look you know what there was only four people in the house Courtney, Chris, 
Kalia, and the other baby, Clarissa. So the defense goes over the chain of events. Yeah, the parents put the children to bed around midnight. Kalia woke up several times throughout the night. Around 5.30 a.m., they put her back to bed, and they lay down on the couch. Uh, around 9.30 a.m., Christopher receives a text from his father, uh, and he's saying that he had sent him some money to help him pay for rent. Now, at this point, Chris gets up from the couch, and he finds both children to be fine. This is when he goes back to sleep on the sofa, and less than an hour later, Clarissa wakes both the parents up, saying that Sissy is gone. The parents, you know, search around the house. They, of course, discover that the baby is gone, is missing. Uh, search, you know, police are called. Search parties are done. The baby will eventually be found 900 feet away from their trailer. Now, another tactic that the defense will keep going back to is essentially saying, look, the police already decided right off the bat that, you know, it, it was the parents that did it. And the defense calls it out and he says, yeah, you know what? Christopher has a certain look. He's got these face tattoos. Yeah, you know what? They live a certain lifestyle. They do all these drugs and whatnot. You know, he's an easy target, basically. And uh, my whole little sofa sidebar on that is, you know, okay, take all those aspects out. There's so many life behaviors that he's doing that with whether he had face tattoos whether he was doing drugs it's just grimy you know <laughs> actions speak louder than words if he was somebody who was like doing all this wonderful stuff and happened to have had face tattoos and you know happened to be doing some drugs I think people could even be like well hold on you know that's still a red flag not so much the face tats but maybe the drug use but let's let's hear it out but as evidence will show I mean these were just horrible people now Courtney's defense basically doesn't say much he just gets up there. He thanks the jury for their time. He drills in the aspect of reasonable doubt. And, you know, Courtney's going to have a little bit of a different angle on this uh, that we'll see come out in the trial. Regardless, she is still being hit with the same negligent kind of charges. Now, her defense attorney ends saying the same thing that, yeah, you know what? They are going to be smearing this couple due to some of these, like, superficial aspects, basically. Now, one of the first people that gets on the stand is the 911 operator that took the phone call from Courtney, and they will play this phone call. Uh, Courtney does sound, you know, uh, let's, I, I don't even want to use the word upset. Um, she sounds nervous, you know, frantic. And as we will see from some of the body cam footage, I think that this is more or less coming from drugs than it is a genuine concern for the baby that's missing. Although I do think with Courtney that somewhere buried beneath that is a sense of you know, uh, what happened to my baby, but it's so far down and low on her priority list that it just, it doesn't ever really come to the surface. Now, during this aspect, we can see Courtney and Chris, they're listening to the phone call. Courtney's, you know, not doing too much during this one, but Christopher is going to be a perpetual crocodile tear crier. He wants you to see him crying. He wants tears all over the place. Uh, he is very theatrical and dramatic about it. Now, taking the stand throughout this trial are going to be family members and you know people acquaintances that were close to Chris and Courtney and each of these people typically bring like a story of their own that make them you know very captivating to watch and kind of like huh what and some of these friends and family you can tell cared more about these children than Chris and Courtney did and a prime example of someone that falls into that category is Chris is Courtney's father uh, Tim Bell, and he's going to take the stand. Now, we will learn from Tim Bell that he does not approve of this relationship. He doesn't like Chris. I mean, anyone could have told you that. You know, <laughs> this was not a hard thing to fathom. Now, also, we will be learning from him. The state will bring out basically the family tree aspect, and I mean, it's convoluted but essentially with his testimony the state establishes that yes courtney and chris are first cousins and this is our first like oh my goodness kind of a vibe that we get now we'll also learn that tim basically pays for everything so you know courtney and chris are living in just this literally drug fueled fantasy that has all different types of victims obviously their baby and their children you know but family members, everyone around them that comes with this level of abuse and just bad living. Now, Tim Bell clearly cared for his grandchildren and clearly still does. You know, he actually has emotion. You can tell that they mean something to him and he wants to see his you know family do well. Now, Tim would be the one to go to Courtney's other cousin, who we will hear from her here shortly. And 
Courtney and Chris would pawn their children off on her other cousin. And essentially, and we'll hear through evidence, this cousin would make a phone call to her mother, which was Tim's sister, and he would learn, wait, you know, Courtney and Chris have, you know, pawned off literally a, a two or three day old baby onto this young lady who already has several children. And he's like, that's not right, you know? So he goes down to get the kids and it turns into a you know what show. Now we'll also learn that Tim had a PT Cruiser. Now the state will refer to this car as the meth mobile and that's about all you can damn call it. You know, he would let them use the car but they would take it to do their drug running, stuff like that. And we'll actually hear evidence later that Courtney was trying to trade the car for her kids uh, at a later point. And again, this is completely on brand for these people. It will become apparent that they had a complete fixation on this car. They felt entitled to this car. And this car was like the palette for creating the scene in their life because it gave them mobility to go do all these crazy stuff they were doing. Now the next family member that will come up there is this cousin. Uh, her name is Megan. Now right off the bat they try to establish like a timeline of the coming and goings of Chris and Courtney and it's so confusing with her testimony and whatnot that they have to get the jury out of the room to like line it all up but they did this at this time and did it did, did, I mean it's crazy and so they get all this settled and then they kind of go from there so now she will tell the story of Courtney and Chris always dropping their children off with them you know when they were gonna go on one of their runs or when they were arguing now between those two that probably was all the time and you know she says I already have four children and so she recounts when the newborn and the baby were dropped off Clarissa and Kalia were dropped off at her home and and basically after three days she's like I, I i can't i mean a newborn child that this mother was okay with just pawning off on her cousin and then in addition to that so now that she has five young children running around and a newborn there's absolutely no way now she'll recount how she called her mother and her mother in turn called her brother which was tim bell and he came and got the kids and so megan will emotionally say you know what i felt like it's my fault what happened because i called and that chain of events took place which led to most likely whatever courtney and chris did to the baby you know she feels like she set it off and i'm like what a horrible thing that's what i'm talking about with like these outlying victims in the case because because, you know this girl was doing nothing in fact the fact that this young lady was in these children's lives is probably the most love that kid was going to have felt from someone in those 14 days because I can tell you that Courtney and Chris weren't providing that and she rounds out her testimony with saying she always worried about the children's safety Courtney and Chris's children's safety when they were with them I mean that's a really sad sad thing to say. Now another very damning aspect of evidence that we'll see in this case is the police body cam footage from officers who showed up to the scene after Courtney called 911. And they will be bringing said officers on the stand to go over this type footage. Now one such officer would say, yeah, you know what, I responded to the call and Courtney was just, you know, 100% sure that nobody would have come into the home and taken the baby. You know, and this is one of the things where you start seeing that, you know, when you start trying to dissect what possibly happened, because I think in the beginning of this, there's two different stories going on, what Chris was saying and what Courtney was saying, and then the concocted stories coming from them later, mostly from Chris, who had time to think up something. You know, and we'll get into what my personal thought is as to what happened in a little bit, but this is kind of like the little, you know, preliminary bit to that. Now, the officer said that when he talked to Chris, that yes, he was wet, he was muddy, he was dirty from being in the woods, and that Chris had said, I was in the woods looking for the baby, but Chris never really gave any reasoning as to why he thought the baby would be in the woods. Now, when they show the body cam footage of the home in this phone call, oh my God. I mean, I was like, are you kidding me? First of all, Courtney has a visible black eye. She is chain smoking. Now, the house, and y'all, I'm not trying to house shame people here or whatever. Put yourself in the frame of mind of you just had a newborn baby. You are coming home. This is the world you're wanting said baby to enter into. This house was a 
pigsty, okay? A pigsty. Clothes everywhere, crap everywhere. I mean, I was just like, I mean, it looked like the house had been ransacked. And I think that that was probably picked up a little bit for them. So you see this whole entire state. Now, when the officer starts to ask basic questions, and I'm talking about like, when was the last time you saw the baby? Courtney's like, look, mister, you got the wrong idea here. You know, and I'm kind of like, ugh, that's going to really come back to bite you in the ass there, Courtney. Now, another aspect on some of this footage, we see uh, another officer talking to Chris, kind of in the background, and you can tell Chris is being dramatic, you know, da 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 you know, and I, I'm doing this, and at one point, he just basically starts being like, look, I'm the only one that cares about this missing baby. Me and Courtney ain't nobody up in here caring like I am. And it's just so interesting because everything feels very showmanship and false. It's like we need to visually prove that we love our children, because I can tell you if you want to talk about action speak louder than words that house is showing a whole bunch of inaction then we'll also hear about the aspect of you know yes chris you know so like these are the woods i went into dogs are eventually brought in and both sets of dogs they end up not finding this baby even though they were like super close to where it said child was uh that doesn't happen there's various reasons for this some dogs are trained to find you know, cadavers, some dogs are trained not to, so on and so forth. Now, the officer who showed up the next day when the baby was found, he will talk about the aspect of Courtney showing up in a car a couple hours later with a couple of women, and, you know, we'll hear about this later in the case, too. You know, and he's like, we told her what happened, and basically they're like, well, look, where's Chris? And she was like, well, when we received the information, you know, the text message, the phone call, whatever, of the baby's been found, Chris just freaked out and he's basically like, they're gonna think I did it. They're gonna think I did it. And he jumped out of the car and started running. And I'm like, eh, yeah, okay, that screams innocent. Now, another thing this officer will testify to is he'll say that he asked Courtney, you know, are y'all missing like a bag, a backpack or something? And she will describe down to a T the backpack that the baby was found in. So this is another thing that I'm talking about where in this very early stuff going on, it's almost like Chris and Courtney didn't have their stories together because, you know, first of all, there's one aspect of how does she know that this is the bag that he buried the baby in? How does she know when you look at that mess of a home that that bag is missing, you know, and I guess maybe it was one that Chris used a lot or something, but regardless, you know, you would think if you're trying to line a story up, you would be like, look, we ain't seen that bag, you know, <laughs> like, we don't talk about the bag, but Courtney just goes full throttle, it looks like this, bum, 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 bum. Now, when all this went down, the community really gathered around to help search for, you know, this poor little baby, this 14-year-old who, at that point, they just thought had been kidnapped, was missing something. And so the community came together, and they would bring a couple of members of these search teams on the stands who were essentially part of the aspect of finding the baby. Now, one point of interest is one woman who gets up there says in the woods she found some paraphernalia, basically. And that paraphernalia would be like a wallet, a jacket, a hookah, and some rolling papers. Now, soon after that discovery, the baby would be found. Now, another lady would testify about where the baby was found and essentially there was a hole it had some debris over it and they would learn that the dogs were like literally feet away from this uh you know when they had brought the dogs in but they would see this once she saw like this bag and all that kind of stuff she was like oh my god and she called you know officers and whatnot in and now the bag that she said that she found was shocker wait for it the exact same description that courtney gave of the bag that they were missing now another aspect of this case we're gonna call it grim, we're gonna call it horrifying, is that of the coroner. The lady who performed the autopsy is Dr. Laura Darisol. Now she was also the same medical examiner in the Rosenbaum trial. That was another horrifying, horrifying a case involving children. Now she has performed like over 5,000 autopsies, testified in over 200 cases. I mean, she is excellent. You can tell this woman is so intelligent and good at what she does. She doesn't, you know, really uh, even get bothered that easily when people try, like the defense and people like that really try to come at her. She just sticks to facts and she is just very even keel and I could literally listen to her talk all day long. Now they will show the jury and, you know, I'm assuming the courtroom pictures, but they're not shown here. I don't want to see them, really don't even want to think about these injuries. I mean, I just can't imagine. But the picture that is painted with the injuries to this poor little baby, 
I mean, it just paints a horrifying picture of her last moments of life. Some of the wounds on her are a horizontal cut beneath one eye, teeth had come out of the gum because of laceration, a bruise on the left side of the cheek and jawline, multiple fractures to skull, brain was not formed well and was mostly watery, and she would say that the cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head and listed it as a homicide. Now, as you can imagine, a 14-year-old baby, like she's saying, I mean, the skull hadn't formed yet, the brain hadn't formed yet. I mean, this is, you know how, if you have children, if you've been around children, whatever, you know how delicate a 14-year-old is. So to imagine what happened at the hands of Christopher is just unfathomable. Now, the defense will try and go along with some type of a crushing injury. And, you know, Dr. Lord does say, yeah, you know what, that is possible. But the defense is trying to go in the way of like a TV falling or something of this nature. And she's like, well, no, the evidence will show the baby is sleeping and it's sleeper on the bed. So that, that wouldn't have happened. So again, for all the concoctions that Chris and Courtney have tried to come up with, as well as their defense, there's just solid evidence that says, mm -mm, not really. Now we will continue to see more and more family members come up. And another one that takes the stand is Courtney's aunt. This is Megan's mother. Megan is the cousin who Courtney and Chris pawned the infant on. My God, that exhausted me. <laughs> but anyways, so Courtney's aunt takes the stand. Now she'll testify about the same thing we heard Megan say. Yes, Megan calls me, she's exhausted. You know, they haven't come and gotten the children. She calls Tim and they all end up over there, you know, at the house and she will testify that this is when, you know, this whole little scene happens and Courtney and them are there and Courtney's like, well, I I'll, take, I I'll take the PT for the kids. You know, the PT cruiser for the kids, the meth mobile for the children, you know, and this is where her trying to pawn the kids off for that. Now, Courtney will paint a picture, she'll try to, of, well, I wanted it to go, be able to go visit my babies. We know that ain't the truth. And now she will be asked, uh, Courtney's aunt will be asked, well, what do you think? How do you think she meant it? You know, do you think that she meant, wanted to get the car to go, you know, on a drug run or to be able to visit her kids? And the aunt was like, I can't say. And again, what a sad statement. What is sad that we even have to ask the question, number one. Number two, that your own damn blood is like, I don't know, to be honest, you can't tell with her. I mean, come on. Now this same aunt would say, you know what, yeah, fast forward a few days after this, Courtney calls baby's missing, and she's one of the people that go to the scene to try and help, you know, like what's going on type scenario. Now another family member that takes a stand is Pamela Hambley, and bless her heart. Pamela is Courtney's mother. Pamela is Chris's aunt. Pamela's brother is Chris's father. This is how they are first cousins. I'm not awake enough for this yet, y'all. I need some damn, I need some damn coffee. <sighs> Let's continue. She did not raise Courtney. Courtney's grandparents raised her. So now that we have all that out there. <laughs> okay, I mean, it's all I can take of that. Let's continue. She was the passenger seat in the car when they were riding back home. So it's, you know, Courtney and Chris were in the car up until this point, and then another young lady and the mother. So, and we'll hear from the young lady who was driving in a little bit. So they're driving back. This is when the information comes in of we have found the baby. And this is when Chris allegedly jumps out of the car and starts running. So during this aspect, you know, the aunt will testify, yes, we were actually on the way to the house to talk to the media. And this is when we intercepted this phone call of what happened. And this is when Chris jumps out of the car and runs. And the aunt will say, I told him to get out of the car. Well, this just stops everything and it's tracks. First of all, the state will ask her, look, was your first thought that Chris or Courtney killed the baby? And she was like, no. And so then the state's like, okay, well, hold up, hold up, hold up. You know, when we interviewed you, uh, you know, you didn't say this whole thing about telling Chris to get out of the car. This goes back and forth, and I mean, so on and so forth, and it's exhausting. You know, because remember, when all these witnesses are getting up there, they've already talked to these people for the most part, and kind of gone over like, okay, look, yes, this is what I said in this statement, da 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 You know, so there's all that. So when somebody gets up there like that and throws in something under oath, it's like, well, wait, why are you saying that? You know, why are you saying that now? And when they're like, oh, I don't know, you know, I must have forgot. It just doesn't go over well. Courtney's mother's time in the stand will be very tumultuous. And even when Courtney's defense 
defense attorney gets up there to drill her, and that's exactly what he does. He makes note that she has seven children by five different men, and that she only raised like one of them, you know. And then he also questions her, insinuates, throws it out there that he's like, well, weren't you talking to Christopher McNabb on a secret Facebook account and hooking up with him behind your daughter's back? And she's like, oh, oh no. Oh no. When he drops that bomb, I'm like, oh my god. You know, I just, my heart can't take much more of this. You know, and I'm like this. I'm like, look, y'all, it just doesn't get much more cheap and tawdry. From what we've heard so far on the stand of this case, it's like, I, I'm sorry, miss. We just have to ask this, but have you been hooking up with your nephew, your daughter's, you know, man? We we have to ask because it's completely plausible. So now another young lady we will hear from is the young lady who is driving the car on the way to the media when they find out that, you know what, up oh, the, the baby's been found, Chris jumps out of the car, so on and so forth. Now, her name is Lauren, and honestly, she has some of the most authentic emotion in this case. She has the upsetness that you would expect to see from a parent, you know? <laughs> like, you would expect to see from the mother or the father or something like that when she's recounting this. You can tell that this is traumatic and shocking to her. Now, Lauren says, you know what, yeah, I'm driving them back, and this news comes in, and she's like, we didn't know if the baby was alive alive or dead yet. All we knew is they found the baby. But Chris, they acted like they already knew. Like Chris already acted like he knew the baby was dead. You know? And so, again, so damning, so telling. Now, she also says all of them, the whole damn crew, was acting sketchy AF, like they were all methed up, and she was like, it was very uncomfortable. And then to top it off, Courtney wanted to stop into a place called Anderson Circle, and she's like, that place is like known for, it's nothing but drugs. You know? And she She's like, I'm scared to go in there. I wasn't going in there. And she's, you know, also the only one that seems to be saying, um, hello, we just got a phone call saying your baby's been found. Okay. And you're wanting to go there? Are you kidding me? And that's literally the only thing you could say. I mean, that right there alone, it's like, judge, swing the damn gavel down, case damn closed. This young lady literally has the most common sense of all these people. And I'm so thankful for people like her who come forward and speak their truth to help put these monsters behind bars. Now, she would also say that Pam, Courtney's mother, Chris's aunt, slash potentially, you know, a secret hookup lover, whatever. She's saying that she got out of the car and had, like, opened the door for him to get out of the car. So that she basically assisted in him doing so. You know, okay. You know, regardless, he ran. Okay. <laughs> you know, he ran when he found out that the baby was found. His first reaction was not, oh, thank God, let's go see our baby girl. It was, I'm going to be blamed for it. Let me go. So he already knew what happened to that baby because he did it to the baby. Now, not just family is up there testifying. They're pulling everyone into this damn case, even the lady working at the damn gas station down the road. Now, the gas station worker, her name is Julie, and she would testify that Courtney and Chris came in and were basically like, hey, look, if somebody comes in here with a baby that don't look like it's supposed to be theirs, you need to call the police. Yeah, and can I get a pack of rolling papers and some uh, Marlboros unfiltered? I mean, it literally feels like they were in there getting their monsters and rolling papers and blunts and whatever else they got. You know, and they were like, oh yeah, you know what? Maybe we should tell them. We should put up one of those little things like they do for missing dogs and cats. Let's do one of those, Chris. Now, after Chris ran from the police and was like hiding in the woods or whatever he did, you know, for a day, the gas station is where he goes. He probably ran out of Monster, you know, or whatever it is that he was like all cracked out on. You know, so he went in there and basically he was like, yeah, you know that baby that I'm looking for? That's my baby. That's my baby. I'm coming forward. I'm coming forward like he did something. Now, several people who had, we'll call them maybe run-ins or run-arounds, whatever you want to say with Courtney and Chris, would come to the stand. Their testimony would also be so alarming because you're sitting here listening to it and you're realizing this is the behaviors that are going on in a household. Number one, in a household. I don't care if you have kids or not. So there's that. Number two, 
you have a newborn who most likely wasn't even there at the house with them at that time, but regardless, a newborn and then another very young child in the home. And this is what you're doing. So this is what I was talking about earlier when the defense is like, well, look, they got face tattoos and they do drugs. And I'm like, look, we can get past that. You know what I'm saying? Like, what if he was going to school right now and trying to get his master's in, you know, something or whatever, you know, it doesn't even matter. Community college, whatever, you know, working a full-time job, da, 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 all this stuff. You know, yeah, the people are going to have opinions on stuff like that, but it's these kind of actions that we're about to hear about that just make you say, I don't care if you have face tattoos or not. I don't care if you do drugs or not. This behavior is unacceptable in a household with small children, one of them not even two weeks old. Now, a gentleman named Craig Weatherford would take the stand. He was currently incarcerated, and this is Courtney's other cousin. Now, he was at the trailer with Courtney and Chris the day before the baby went missing. They were all smoking meth and getting high. You know, just regular, like, family time. Now, he said at that point the baby was fine. You know, as fine as a baby can be with their, you know, caretakers smoking meth in the next room, but that's a whole other thing. Now, he would say that he was, like, active, like, putting stuff on social media, trying to help find the baby, and he would say that that next night that Courtney and Chris would come back to their house with his fiance and their kids, and that's where, you know, Chris would do another thing where he spoke to the police there or the media or something like that. Now, during said, you know, talking to the media or whatever, Chris would get very, you know, emotional or whatever, and he'd be like, that's my kid. I want my kid back. I want my baby back. Again, smoke and mirrors, if you ask me. Now, he would say when they were all back at his house, they were, like, trying to come up with, like, who could have taken the baby? You know, who would have done this? Yada, yada, yada. And they were, like, trying to come up with a list of names. And he's like, but they only could really come up with a couple of names. And he's like, we went to go drive around to look at houses. But he's like, Courtney and Chris acted like they didn't really even want to look. Now, he said the next day when they got up, he said he got a very eerie, bad feeling off those two. I can't believe it took that long. But he was like, I just... I wanted them gone. You know, I just wanted them gone. And so they were basically going to like go search for the baby. And he said, but they ended up dropping Courtney and Chris off at Courtney's mother's house. The one we saw on the stand a little bit ago. So they could get high, you know. So there's that. You can't ever say her mama wasn't there for her. Now, this trial is literally a stiff competition as to what part of the evidence, what part of the testimony is the most incriminating. But when Jeff Alexander, investigator detective Jeff Alexander, gets on the stand to talk about the interviews he conducted, I was like, done. <laughs> if you didn't already know they were pretty guilty at this point, done. Now, the cringe that these interviews served was so painful. I literally thought about filing suit against the damn TV network and the investigator for some kind of pain and suffering that, of course, I willingly entered into because I couldn't look away. Now, the audio is very difficult to hear in these interviews, and isn't it always that way? I mean, I get that we're kind of hearing secondhand recordings, but I'm just like, can we please invest in decent audio recordings as well as some kind of a filter for people that cough? that are in the in the uh, courtroom while a live trial is going on. I mean, those two inventions right there, please someone cook it up. Now, Christopher would go on and on about just idiotic information during these interviews. You know, about his plans to marry Courtney, what kind of car he's gonna buy her, which we all know by now is a sore point in this future marriage. Now, he does recount the story. You know, the interviewer is asking him, like, what happened these last 25 hours? And, you know, he's recounting the story and he's like, well, yeah, you know, Tim Bale showed up to steal our car, take our babies, you know, and then Chris is all trying to act like they actually want the kids right now. Chris paints a picture of a loving, normal family in these interviews, which you know through evidence is far from true. A couple of the finer quotes that he said during these interviews are, I'm just loving my babies. You know, it was just regular family living. And I'm like, we have seen the body cam footage of your home. We have met most of your family and friends. It is far from regular family living. Just saying. Now, Chris begins to walk the investigators through what happened, and he's like, yeah, you know what? We both received a text from my dad talking about, you know, I paid your bills, you losers, and, you know, so on and so forth, going back to sleep, and then Clarissa waking him up. And he's like, you know, at first I thought she had picked the baby up, and, you know, taking the baby somewhere because she likes to do that. We had to get on her. You know, she was picking that baby up. And I'm just like, 
Is he literally trying to set things up that his daughter did this to the baby? Okay. Not even a five-year-old. I'm just like, what alternate universe do we live in here? Now he talks about running around the house. He's like, gosh, out of my underwear, looking around the trailer. You know, and he's like, and then Tim called Courtney and Tim was like, you know, well, where's Chris at? This is when he was in the woods or whatever. And Courtney cushed him out, you know, for asking that. And I'm like, I'm glad to see your priorities are always in the right order, even in times of stress. Now at this point, he tries to conjure tears up during the interview and he's all like, that's my baby. There's my baby, and she's gone, but I just gotta keep my head up. I just gotta lace up her face up. Now, also in the courtroom while he's watching this, I mean, he's just trying to boo-hoo, and I mean, just laying it on thick. Now, y'all, this part, the secondhand embarrassment, is so strong, I damn near left the YouTube app a one-star review, because I was like, this should, no, just no. And I literally am probably going to have to seek some psychotherapy to be like, why do I do this to myself? Now, another very cheap blow at trying to cast blame is he's like, well, I know my stepmom at one point, she was talking about, I'm going to take that baby for a few months since the other baby, Clarissa, likes to pick up the little baby so much. But Courtney was like, no way. No, ma'am. That's my baby. I'm going to keep her. Unless you got a 20 Rock or PT Cruiser, I'm keeping that baby. As much stuff as he tries to say happened during these 14 days of life, I'm just like, it sounds like years worth of dra drama. I mean, I'm like, the child was only 14 days old when she was, you know, stolen from Earth. And aside from that, you know, you didn't even have her that much. You know, so it's it shocks me how many events and stuff has gone on. I'm like, what? You know, I'm just like, oh, that's so cute. Bless his heart. He thinks we believe him. Now, throughout this interview, in addition to, like, throwing his children and family under the bus, you know, he's trying to drop little hints at things, covering all bases to, you know, come up with a, a motive for someone else, someone else that could have done this to them. Now, he will talk about someone else that had broken into their house like a few months prior. And I'm kind of like, how would you ever know someone broke into your house? The only way it's possible is if this happened and they came home and he was like, Courtney, there ain't no dishes in the sink. The clothes are folded. The garbage was picked up off the floor. Someone's been in here and it ain't been us. Now, the cop will begin to ask common sense questions such as why would somebody break into your home and still a two week old i mean these children require tons of care you know why would a robber do that of course there's no good answer for this because it didn't happen now the officer even tries to like you know throw chris a little something he's like is it possible that maybe courtney accidentally did this yeah but chris is not budging now eventually this officer will leave they'll bring courtney in and you know you will see them talking you know conversing crying that kind of thing courtney does seem to be genuinely upset during this aspect during the actual trial the one that we're watching we do you see both of them they are crying during this point uh, and eventually an officer will come in and basically say look this is done for the night they let them go and you know because they know they're just you know they're giving them enough rope to hang themselves with now Courtney's interrogation serves just as much cringe during her interrogation she's upset you know she's like I can't imagine why somebody would do this to us she says it feels like she's in a movie and that she always tried to keep her baby safe now again these detectives are trying to ask her like break over your mind think of who would do this but Courtney's like, I, there's nobody that would do this to us. We don't really have any enemies. You know, so Courtney paints a kind of different picture. Now, she too does mention the baby, her their other baby, Clarissa, that would pick up the infant and so on and so forth. You know, but she's just kind of scratching her head over this. Now, after they're done with these interviews, showing the interviews, going over this, they go back to questioning Jeff Alexander on the stand in, the, in real time. Now, during this, they will go over some of these, you know, propositions that were thrown out there by Chris and Courtney as to what could have happened you know and the detective will say look you know what with the timeline he's given with his history it is highly unlikely that someone broke into this home to retaliate against them and stole the newborn and killed the newborn you know while the father's sleeping on the sofa you know i mean it doesn't even make sense now they also talk about the aspect of typical child abduction cases are oftentimes you know some extended family members such as chris trying to say it was his stepmother and they're like look we quickly determined that that wasn't the case in this then also they asked the detective you know well what about someone trying to break in like trying to still you know like large sums of money things of this nature and he's basically like did you see those uh 
police cam footage? Yeah, I think we all know that wasn't the case. Now they will go back over another interview conducted with Chris. This would come after his arrest for the probation violation. You know, they at first they like looked past that. They knew that he was on the radar and it had, you know, you violated. You know, so they were kind of waiting for this to get a little more stuff in. And so they arrest him. He's incarcerated on this probation violation. They have him sitting where they need him. And so they bring him back in. Now remember, at this point, he would have had time to have maybe cleared his mind up a little bit, you know, start really concocting some stories, and he definitely is eager to tell them. So one thing they begin to question him about is the time he was on Facebook during like the evening prior to this, like the, you know, the overnight session that, that led to this happening or whatever. And he's trying to get the times and all that. And he gets very frustrated with this and he slams his fist down. And he's like, I can't remember all day. I just know I ain't kill my baby. Also, what will come up in this is the detective was like, look, when Christopher was booked on these lesser charges, you know, a few days after or whatever, he sent us a note uh, saying that he might have information on this whole scenario. And so they went to go visit him to see, you know, okay, well, what is it? One thing we'll see with this is essentially, in my opinion, all Christopher's trying to do is to see what information they have at this point. One of the first thing he asks is, have you talked to Courtney? You know, and so we'll see that he's trying to find out what they know so he can, you know, rearrange his story. And he's like, well, look, one day I called Courtney and now she's all scared she's going to get locked up too. But she told me this story and I think it's going to crack the case. So the story eventually circles around Courtney saying that she was at this girl's house. She doesn't know whose house it was. Okay. A girl there is basically like, come on, Courtney, go to the store with me. Let's go get some mad dog. And Courtney's like, I ain't know you. We ain't going. And the girl's like pressuring her and pressuring her. So basically she's like, look, what's up? And this girl whispers, I know who killed your baby. So Courtney goes with them. And then basically it comes out that this guy named Shane, who we will see on the stand after a while, uh, a family friend of Chris's, uh, hung out with Chris most every single day, was very tight in the circle, had told told this girl that someone put a hit out on Christopher. Now this detective is not having this and he just basically sits back, you know, almost to the stint of, I shaved my legs for this, you know, and Chris begins to grovel and insists that he didn't do this, so on and so forth. Now again, Chris goes, uh, rambles and does all this stuff and essentially uh, when all said and done, the officer is like, you know what, all the information, all the evidence we have, to be quite frank, points back to you. And then Chris is basically like, you know what, at the end of the day, I feel like she ain't here no more cause of meth. You know, cause everyone we knew was into meth. Everyone that came around the house was into meth. And so, and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, we can agree on something. And then Chris is like, almost thinking out loud. And he's like, why won't the baby found on the first day? And to him, this proves that someone still had the baby. And he's like, right there, reasonable doubt. Part of me is like, does he think they're just gonna like let him go? Now at one point the detective's like, look, when's the last time you put hands on Courtney? And he goes off on this huge rant and he rounds this rant out by saying, I swore to Courtney, I will never put hands on her, never again, no more. And even if that means I have to leave her, then I will. Cause that's what real love is. And part of me is like, you should submit that to Hallmark. I have a feeling they would buy that to put on a card. Now he finishes off one of these interviews with basically describing what I would say could also be described as alien abduction. Um, basically he's describing something where he didn't know what was going on. You know, all this is due to drugs. And essentially, again, he's just trying to line his table with excuses of anything shy of, I know what I did and I did it on purpose. You know, I want to alleviate myself from being accountable. Now, when the state will re-question Jeff Alexander in the stand about this, they will establish that both Chris and Courtney had said, yeah, he was wearing these blue kind of boxers on the night that this happened. These would be the same type boxers that were found in the bag with the baby. He also establishes this for the, the same thing about the shirt that he was wearing, again, found in the bag. And they also talk about and establish that both of them described this bag that the baby was found in. You know, so no matter how they twist their stories around, it all comes back to the evidence speaks for itself. Now, when they talk about other people that he had tried to blame, they'll bring up evidence showing these people were locked up during this time, so it couldn't have been them. Now, remember how I was talking earlier about 
investigators being very much like, when were you on Facebook and when did you do this and yada, yada, yada. Well, there's a reason for that. And that reason is named Courtney, not Courtney Bell, not the baby mama on trial, another Courtney. I can't make this stuff up. Now this new Courtney, Courtney Morris, she is currently incarcerated uh, and this is on possession of meth and she is going to also take the stand. Now what she'll be taking the stand about is about conversations that she had with Christopher McNabb on Facebook. Now these conversations begin about 10 p.m. at night and they end around 9 a.m. the next day. Now remember this is the overnight session that took place, you know, while allegedly they were sleeping and then the baby's, you know, gone by 9.30 the next day. So this is a huge crack in Christopher's story uh, as to what's going on. Now, this Courtney Morris has never actually met Chris in person. They've kind of run in the same circles. So this is their first date, if you will. Now, she will testify that the screen name to the eligible bachelor that she was talking to is Jordan Headcrack Izzo. Now, through these messages, it becomes clear that Chris is clearly flirting with her. He fancies her and he blocks her at one point and then unblocks her and he basically is trying to say it's an accident most likely Courtney the the baby mama Courtney saw him doing this and there's probably an argument over it this is his mo this guy is just a piece of garbage and so this is what he does and Courtney just seems to run after him now they'll bring another witness on the stand that kind of ran in this crowd uh, he was also currently incarcerated at the time of this trial uh, his name was Matthew Lester now he would testify that he went to Chris's and Courtney's one time and he got jumped. Now, this is the part that I'm talking about where I'm like, this is the kind of stuff you have going on in this household with kids. I mean, really? You know, <laughs> even if the kids were at home at that time, it's just, it's crazy to think of the things that these people were bringing around their home. Now, he would say that Chris used brass knuckles on him. And he would say that this beef was over another guy's mother who this guy was going out with and they said that he was laying hands on him. And so this all ensued. Now yet another person to get on there and testify is Shane Kidd. Remember we talked about him earlier. This guy was an entire mood. <laughs> I mean, I was just like, this dude is so like low key funny and just his delivery of stuff. And you know, he doesn't want to be up there. You know, he feels a certain way about things and he is just matter of fact. Now, this is a gentleman who was family friends with Christopher McNabb. Uh, he's 41 years old. He basically saw Christopher grow up, which makes it kind of a little odd. Now he admits to setting up the situation for this dude to get his butt kicked at Christopher's house. And then and when they're like, well, what did you do during this time where this attack was taking place? And he was like, I just played Xbox. I want none of my business. You know, and it's just that kind of thing that you're like, okay. Now, Shane will knock down Chris's story that he, meaning Shane, was the one who dropped all that paraphernalia off in the woods. Remember, they found the hookah thing and the rolling papers and stuff like that. Chris earlier would have tried to say that Shane did that. Well, Shane's like, I've never even seen this place in the woods. You know, I've never even been there. I've I don't even know what that, I, it wasn't me. Now he would go on to testify that, yeah, you know what? He knows that Chris assaults Courtney. He's even seen him do it while she was pregnant. And also Shane would say, you know what? Yeah, I'm the one who has, you know, the math, the goodies, whatever. And that he would share it with Chris. Now they would show a Facebook conversation that would show Christopher McNabb trying to buy some meth off of him the day before the baby was found. He would also go on to confirm the story that Courtney had told about being at the house where the girl said that he had set something up or a hit or whatever, even though he would deny that actually being the case. Now, some really damning information that kind of gives me chills. Shane would say that the morning that the baby was missing, he would have text conversations with Christopher. Christopher was wanting him, Shane, to come pick him up, take him away from the house, and basically he was like, you know, I'm wigging and tripping and what he meant by that was you know he's been up too long you know smoking he's paranoid all that kind of stuff well within an hour he would be texting Shane saying the baby's missing he can't find the baby now what this shows to me is a couple of things so first of all we have Shane over here who I believe Shane's testimony you know and Shane's saying you know what I mean an hour before this baby this all popped off you know Chris is trying to get me to come pick him up to probably get high again or whatever saying that he's all tweaked out you know so I'm like, okay, so here's this tweaked out father. And then all of a sudden this happens to the baby. Well, we've heard from the medical examiner, the injuries. So I'm like, yeah, probably could have taken something very little. And he snapped in a quick punch 
I mean, that's all it would have taken. It's all very alarming and chilling. Now, another investigator we'll hear from is Special Investigator Bo. We will hear a jailhouse conversation between Courtney and Chris during his time on the stand. Now, right off the bat in this conversation, you can tell Courtney's pissed, and she's like, what did you do to the baby? And Chris is like, I can't believe you're saying I did this. You know, and Chris is trying to be like, look, are you okay? And she's like, I'm never gonna be okay. You know, my baby's dead. I won't be okay until I know what happened. Now, during this phone conversation, Courtney brings up the fact that Shane said Chris was texting him that morning that this all went down. Now, Chris says that Shane is lying, but it shows us, okay, so Shane is probably telling the truth. You know, this is most likely what happened. She also brings up the whole thing about this girl that Christopher was texting. Now, during this also, she, you know, Chris is like, look, baby, you gonna come visit me? And she's like, when I find out what happens to the baby, I'll come. Now, here's my thing with this phone call. It can go one or two ways. First of all, I think that they're not dumb. They've all each been in jail, all that kind of stuff. They know these phone conversations are recorded it would only benefit Courtney to portray that behavior you know that shock that what you know this some of the stuff cannot be a surprise to her she knows he's out cheating possibly sleeping with her mother you know so this is not a surprise so what does make me say huh is I do wonder if when all this popped off if Chris was basically like, you know, she didn't know what happened, you know, and so Chris was kind of lying about things, but Courtney's toxic behavior and always wanted to bring Christopher back, creating the environment for him to be there. She was like turning a blind eye, but then when it got to this point of these hardcore charges coming, that's where she's like, uh, you know, kind of a thing. It's hard to tell with her. Regardless of any of that, the lack of prioritizing the needs of her children is astonishing. Now, in some trials, the closing statements will make you think, you know, like, my God, you know, which way is this going to go? You know, they might walk or, you know, this is an easy one. This one, y'all, we could have told you before we finish the damn opening statements. Now, McNabb's closing will come first. The attorney starts off with basically just groveling and kissing butt to the jury. It's all they essentially have. Overall, he's going with the story that somebody broke in and took the baby and did this. He says, you know what? This is what happened. And they focused on Christopher immediately. Why did they focus on him? The face tattoos, the violence against Courtney, and the drug abuse. Now, he will go into what reasonable doubt as a little bit of a historical narrative on the justice system. You name it, he talks about it. Now, he will also go over the charges as well. McNabb would be charged with eight counts, including malice murder, two counts of felony murder, second degree murder, aggravated battery, cruelty to children and both the first and second degree, and concealing the death of another. Now, he'll round out his his closing with asking some questions, you know, which revolve around, you know, what's the state's case based on? You know, their lifestyle? Yeah. Him searching in the woods? Yeah. The fact that the things found with the baby were Chris's and what he had on? Yeah. And the fact that Chris ran out of the car when he found out what happened? Guilty knowledge? Yeah. Now, these are all things that I'm like, yeah, that's what the case is, the state's case is based on, and those are all pretty reasonable. But the defense will try and say, you know what, the reason those clothes were in there is because the baby was next to a thing of laundry, and the, the whoever did this took the clothes and wrapped the baby up in that. And I mean, I'm just like, it doesn't matter where you're at in this household, you're going to be next to laundry because it's spread all over the damn place. Now, one thing his attorney does, and I'm just like, don't do that, is he'll use certain words in the closing. And for example, if you think that he horrifically killed this baby, and I'm listening to this and I'm like, don't say that because I can assure you everybody already thinks that and you're just conjuring that image up even more. Like if you're like... Take the temperature of the room. Don't say horrifically kill the baby. You know what I'm saying? Why put that imagery in everybody's mind? Now his defense will keep bringing things up like, why would Christopher do this? Why would he use his own clothes? Why would he do this out in the woods behind the house? It, this is very easy because he's a moron. Now, even the attorney wants to get in on the cringe of this case. Towards the end, he's like, you know what? It's really hard with cases like this because I have kids. <laughs> And I'm just like, please tell me the attorney isn't trying to cry. Please tell me the attorney is not trying to cry. 
I mean, you can't make this stuff up. Now, Courtney's attorney gets up there. He's going to go with a reasonable doubt thing. He's also going to go with the aspect of, you know, look, there's no murder weapon. There's no this, there's no that. Courtney's in a little bit of a different situation, even though she's getting hit with some of these same charges. Uh, you know, but if you're looking at the evidence, it is kind of like, okay, it lo very much looks like Chris is the one who did the actual harm while it looks like courtney was you know negligent and a bystander but she also allowed this to happen so you know honestly she's just as guilty as far as i'm concerned now he'll try and go with like you know some socioeconomic issues as to why this is taking place with them and while i do think that that is a real thing that can take place i just believe in this case particular there's so much other evidence outlining such horrific behavior on both of the parents parts that that aspect th these are not just targeted people you know <laughs> the evidence speaks volumes now he will also go over the charges for courtney and those are as follows murder in the second degree cruel and excessive physical pain with blunt force trauma cruelty to children in the second degree now the state gets up for her closing and this i just i loved her closing now she will start her closing off with painting like a beautiful picture of the innocence of you know a newborn a baby you know and really just dream bringing home the fragileness of life and then she'll say sadly what most people are probably thinking which is you know what, when that baby left those hospital doors, that poor child's fate was all but sealed. And sadly, this is true and we see it happen in so many cases. Now she'll say that this all began with what she has termed as the meth mobile, the PT cruiser. Now she just calls a spade a spade. She says, you know what, it's obvious that Chris didn't love this baby because he didn't even love Courtney. And while he's running around trying to be some badass, Courtney's run around chasing him instead of watching out for her kids. Now she'll talk about all the things that we have already heard. You know, dropping the kids off at Megan's house days after the baby was born. Tim Bell being the one to swoop in and try and take care of the kids and taking the car away so that they can't run around chasing after drugs. Now she goes back over and admits, yeah, there's no real visible crime scene. Yeah, these were internal injuries, so no, there's not going to be blood splattered everywhere in this kind of a thing. She also brings up another good point where she's like, you know what, when you look at most mothers Facebook timelines you know and or fathers even or whatever when you see pictures of their newborn you hear stuff like that absolutely no evidence of this with these two now while she's up there seeing all this Christopher is over there just shaking his head like no she got it all wrong she got it all wrong and she even says he can sit over there and shake his head all he wants I mean she she has his number and she calls it out for this jury now in regards to Courtney she'll say you know what Courtney was always trying to get back with McNabb you know point blank period you know I and mean, she'll say look Courtney even admitted that look Christopher isn't a good fit for a family for a father because of their drug use and all these problems they have now she says she has no doubt that Courtney probably wanted a family a husband that kind of a life but Christopher McNabb was never going to be that person. Now she will go over the timeline and this is what's just so chilling about this. The baby was born on September 23rd and stays in the hospital for four days. October 1st is dropped off at Megan's house while Courtney's chasing Chris around. October 3rd is when Tim Bell comes and gets the kids and the car. October 5th, Courtney is at her dad's house trying to get the car back while texting with Chris and him telling her to steal the car. October 6th, Tim brings the kids back to the house. October 7th, missing. October 8th, the baby is found. This is horrible. So you see, they barely had this child barely had this child. They were more concerned with stealing their father's car and just getting involved in nonsense. The state will compare putting Christopher McNabb in a room with your baby, the same thing as putting that baby in the room with a rattlesnake. In regards to verdicts, this one took no time at all did we think it would? I literally think the jury went back in the room and just kind of like did stuff out of sheer embarrassment of, are we allowed to walk right back out there? Like, do y'all want to do some quick charades or something? Maybe do some icebreakers? Cause I think by law we have to stay back here at least like what, 30 minutes? In less than an hour, that jury returned guilty on all counts for both of them. 
like we thought it was going to be any different. Now, the judge polls the jury, and the whole time, of course, Christopher McNabb is just shaking his head, you know, in disbelief, I guess. Now, this will lead to McNabb getting a little squabble with the judge, and the judge basically has to say, take him out of the courtroom. Now, the judge starts to go over options as to what they can do. You know, maybe we could put him in the back and, you know, do a live stream or this or that. He basically has a lawyer go talk to Christopher. And so this happens, and they bring Christopher back in. Now, when they do bring him back in, Christopher is handcuffed and aggressively chewing bubble gum. Now, for sentencing, you know, the judge asks, look, are there any aggravating factors? And the state, of course, is like, yes. Now, the state will list, I mean, an arm's length of prior misdemeanor charges. These range from theft, lying to cops, juvenile hall, you name it. The judge will allow these in, but he's like, look, I'm not going to, like, you know, enhance the sentence over misdemeanor charges and honestly with this case i'm just like dude we we don't even need that you know he is going to get buried underneath the jail now the state is not yet done with this and they want to call one final witness for sentencing they will call a dr falker up to the stand now she is a psychologist who met with christopher on behalf of the newton dfcs while he was incarcerated now i was expecting her to like kind of testify about some mental type stuff or you know like well the findings that we had in this very complicated psychological testing was yeah 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 so she gets up there and basically she's like, yeah, when we met, you know, we're separated by a piece of glass. And at one point I was typing on the computer and I guess Christopher tapped on the glass, got her attention. And he was like, hey, baby, look over here. Now she would testify that he was wearing a turtle suit. Uh, now a turtle suit is something that people wear when they're on suicide watch. And she said when she looked up, he lifted the turtle suit and he was finishing pleasuring himself all the way to completion. And... <laughs> I was just like, you have got to be kidding me. I'm like, this is what you're saying about this guy right before sentencing? If you had asked me all the things in the world that I would have thought this woman could have said to have made him look horrible, this would not, it wouldn't even have crossed my mind. It would not have occurred to me that he would have done this while sitting incarcerated on these charges. I mean, it's not funny. I'm sure it's very traumatizing for her, but the audacity of it, the disgust of it, it's, it just, it makes me chuckle. And so, you know, it also to see Christopher, I'm like, oh my God. I mean, can you imagine these people are saying this in open court? Well, you already know he's chewing that gum. He's shaking his head no. Now, of course that's all they need to say you know and so they excuse her she starts leaving christopher's like i want to address the court i want to address the court i got something to say i got a right to confront my accuser now you can tell that the lawyer is dying over here okay he is just like oh my god oh my god you know it's like dude they haven't even sentenced you yet to some really horrific charges now christopher's basically like look i just want the court to know I want all the people at home to know I was not pleasuring myself. And them turtle suits, the Velcro's old on them, so they don't really buckle that way. Now, when he's done with that, the judge is like, okay, that's real cute. You know, do you have anything to say about the case itself? You know, <laughs> before we get to sentencing? And he's like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. And he's like, okay, yeah, I, I would like to say the following. He says he has a lot to say, but that he probably can't say half of it. He says, I'm innocent. I didn't do it. Things were said that shouldn't have been able to be said. I have never harmed my kids. I ain't never hurt her in front of them kids. Now, Christopher also says that he does not believe that because somebody had domestic issues with the female in their life, that that should be correlated with harming children. He also says he doesn't believe in beating a child and that he would never do that. Now, the judge kind of interrupts him and he's like, look, I could say a lot of things here, but that's just going to be arguing with you at this point. So I'm just going to ask you this one question. And the judge is like, since you're so innocent, you know, you tell me, what should the sentence be to the man or woman that did this? You know, if we catch them, what should that be? And McNabb's like, they should be under the jail. If you ever catch them, under the jail. And the judge is like, so they should get the maximum sentence then, son. Is that what you're saying? And McNabb is like, most definitely. And so then, y'all, I just love this judge. The judge is like, all right. And he reads out the sentence for McNabb. Y'all, if you look up the word, throw the book at them, buried underneath the jail, any of these terms, Christopher McNabb's picture is there. I mean, this judge messes him up. 
he sentences him to life without parole plus 10 years. Now, next they bring out Courtney. Now, they don't present any aggravating factors, and they basically say, like, her lawyer's like, look, you know, hers was more of a crime of being a willing participant in something as opposed to actually doing it. He says, you know what, this was awful, but she's not as, like, guilty as Christopher was. And he talks about her horrible upbringing and abuse, so on and so forth. Now, the judge also asks her and gives her the chance, you know, do you want to say anything? And she is like, I mean, she's crying, she is really upset, and she's like, I ain't do this. Y'all know I ain't do this. Now the judge will cite a conversation that he had with her in the chambers, which I thought was very interesting because it told me that she truly could not wrap her mind around why she was getting these charges. And he's like, look, the reality of what happened and what you think happened is vastly different. And he reminds her why she was hit with these charges. And he's like, it's not because you physically did this. He's like, it's because you created and allowed this situation to happen. Now he will also cite the state's example of, you know, Christopher being akin to a rattlesnake snake and he's like look you know allowing Christopher to come into your life and taking him back all the time because you wanted your family to have you know a, a family type vibe your kids to know what a family was like I mean it's just asinine and he tells her he calls her right out he's like you run around chasing Chris smoking meth flies in the face of what any normal mother would do Belle says that she has a sickness and that she tried to be a good mama, but that is not enough. Now, the judge goes much lighter on her sentence. Count one sentence is to 30 years with the first 15 years to be served in prison and the other on probation. Now, her other sentence, count three, she gets 10 years that will run concurrent. So, that's where they are. I feel like the judge feels like there is something, you know, that could come of Courtney if she so chooses to, and so he's given her another chance. Christopher, a lost cause he's buried underneath the jail now as we can expect since this trial has happened both Courtney and Chris have petitioned the court for new trials now in Christopher's filings he's saying that the prosecutors were unable to prove you know that he actually did this to the baby and that he had poor counsel because they you know didn't represent him properly now Courtney is also saying the same thing you know she's like look they didn't prove that I had anything to do with this and I had you know an effective counsel now McNabb is currently an inmate at the Hayes State Prison in Tryon and Bell is currently serving at the Pulaski State Prison in Hawkinsville. Now a relative has custody of the couple's older daughter. So that is the case of the McNabb and Bell saga. Again it's unfortunate that the small young baby not even 14 days old was stolen from this earth. I personally think that they are right where they belong. I don't know if you can ever redeem yourself after this or if you can ever change your life around after something so intense and traumatic and I'm mostly speaking for Courtney. I can't imagine they would get another trial. The evidence is insane in this. Now, I appreciate all of you watching. Thank you to the Patreons, the subscribers, the uh, the channel members, and everyone who comments and shares in our conversations here at the Sofa Squad. You make this channel possible. If you want to see more of my commentary on cases and other kind of bizarre things, just click the links that are popping up. Thank you again for watching, and I'll talk to you soon.